So we all knew this is coming. It was inevitable, like the sun rising at dawn. It's time for us to go back to the series that started all of this. Bros, we're going home. Why the fuck did you do that? He told you what you wanted. You motherfucker, fuck you. I ain't telling you shit. It's okay. No. I believe him. No. That's right, The Last of Us. So for those unaware, this channel has had a very strange relationship with this series. The videos that really pushed us up the totem pole were The Last of Us videos, because they came out when the second game released, you know, the days of very calm and rational debate over the highly anticipated sequel to one of the most popular games of the PS3 era. If you like to, you're a fact, but you get the point. The Last of Us just keeps drifting back here over and over again. It seems no matter how hard we try to forget it, this franchise rips itself out of the ground like a zombie. Hell, I made like three or four videos on why I hated Last of Us 2 so much alone, with the final one being my personal favorite, though a lot of you guys do enjoy the Spec Ops one too. To keep it short, it's bloated, pretentious dreck that copies every trope from any other misery porn trying to be an art film. In fact, there's a specific reason why it turned out the way it did, but we'll get into that a bit later. Instead, I'm just going to cut straight through the bullshit and get to the point. The Last of Us recently was adapted into a 9 episode live action series on HBO, which roughly covers the events of the first game. Now I say roughly for a reason. There's a lot of changes to both events and characters, to the point that it dips into being a loose adaptation in parts. The show was created by Neil Druckmann and Craig Mazin, and stars Pedro Pascal as Joel and Bella Ramsey as Ellie. Now, I already stated that this is a pretty loosey-goosey retelling of the first game's story, starting off in Boston 20 years after a zombie apocalypse thanks to mutated cordyceps infecting humans, and it follows our protagonists as they work their way across the country in the hopes of finding a cure for the infection. So for those that have zero clue about The Last of Us game or anything related to the franchise, let me warn you that this is full of spoilers for both the game and show alike, so I'd recommend sitting down and playing the game, or, in all honesty, watching the cutscenes on YouTube, so you can get the full story before diving in. Alright, we good? Groovy. So, The Last of Us is basically a marriage of three different apocalypse stories. The Road by Cormac McCarthy, Children of Men, and 28 Days Later. It explores the themes of human depravity, loss, and holding on to hope in a very bleak world. In fact, the inspirations are so heavy that if you've seen any of the three above, you can pick out entire plot points that Last of Us takes and uses for its own story. The most obvious ones being older violent man traveling with young innocent child, the road, said child being the only hope for mankind due to being immune to the phenomenon ravaging the world, children of men, and they're running from zombies 20 days later. Trust me, it gets even more blatant as we go on. It's to the point that it directly contradicts a certain element they really want to push, but that's for the end of the video. Fair warning, it's gonna be full of salt because that's something I do have to disclose with this series. I really like The Last of Us game, the first one, even after all these years. Yes, it's directly responsible for over-the-shoulder third-person Sony movie game, that becoming a trend for a full fucking 10 years, but I can't begrudge this game for doing something that other people became desperate to copy, especially since gaming journals just so happen to push for every big-budget game to copy it, since if you play Last of Us 1 on the easiest difficulty, it's basically exactly like watching a movie which is what these guys want, because it means speeding through games as fast as possible for deadlines, and the vast majority of gaming journals 
don't play video games, or have actively grown to despise them. Don't blame the man who gives up on selling burgers to raise sheep, blame the asshole who jacked up the price of mutton. Now, I say this because Last of Us has become one of the most contentious franchises out there in gaming. You can ask 50 different people their opinions on Last of Us, and you'll get just as many opinions. To some, this is the greatest franchise to have ever graced the gaming landscape, and everything else must kneel before its might. To others, it's an overrated movie game that's only finally remembered for an above-average story and pretty graphics. Now, as stated, I like The Last of Us. I genuinely find the gameplay fun, even if it's basically a streamlined, stealth-action shooter, and the story really clicked with me mainly due to its inspirations being some of my favorite stories out there. Children of Men and 20 Days Later are two of my favorite movies, and The Road is a fantastic novel you all should take the time to read. Also, there's a movie you can watch. So, a Naughty Dog game that's basically a mixture of all three, and directed by the Uncharted guy Bruce Straley, sounded like a fantastic mixture. Because remember, this was before Naughty Dog became... what it became. The old guard were still in the company, Bruce Straley and Amy Henning to be specific. Now, Henning's involvement wasn't as intensive as other projects at Naughty Dog. She mainly handled looking over the early drafts of the story. Straley handled the majority of the work. But you might have noticed that I haven't said a certain other person's name in the explanation. Neil Druckmann. That's because he mainly acted as the idea guy, coming up with the concept of The Last of Us and directing the cutscenes. And this is important when you consider how Last of Us 2 came out which was made after Bruce and Amy left. Hey guys, Saul Goodman here. Neil Druckmann fucked over Amy Henning and Bruce Straley and swiped Naughty Dog out from under them after The Last of Us exploded. He famously threw out Amy Henning's script for Uncharted 4, which is what she was working on that kept her involvement with Last of Us to a minimum. She left eight months after the game released and Uncharted 4 was rewritten by Neil Druckmann, which also happened to include a strong female soldier who happens to be mixed race. Clearly, he has a type. Bruce Straley followed not long after Uncharted 4 came out and to this day remains bitter about things, even calling out Druckmann for leaving his name off the credits to The Last of Us HBO series. It's a lot of bad blood that was never made public, but Clearly something happened that caused the sudden shift in the beloved video game company. That's about all there is for this cameo. Loli pays 11 bucks a month for this AI, so you assholes better appreciate it. I'll let him get back to the video. Thank you all, and I fucked your Oshi, Walter. Gura is pregnant with my baby. Now we all laugh at Neil due to how Last of Us 2 turned out, and especially the behavior of Naughty Dog leading up to release, crunching employees to exhaustion and threatening them to stay silent to receive paychecks, on top of abusing DMCA law in order to fuck over leakers. Which is hilarious, considering that not long afterwards, gaming news outlets feigned outrage at CD Projekt Red announcing that they too need to crunch for their game, which didn't have near as many horror stories. But, this is the same industry that sat on the news of Blizzard sexually abusing employees for years while decrying their audience base as sexist for not accepting... I don't know, pick a flaw in gaming and these spineless fucks will defend it. Point is, Night Dog quickly went from a beloved studio that was a sign of quality to a bad joke. Now it's such a minefield to even try to talk about Last of Us because the subject will quickly shift over to the sequel and how it fell the fuck apart. To its credit, at least Last of Us 2 is memorable, but that's not always a good thing. And a lot of people expected the live action series to be their attempt to breathe life into the IP after it quietly went underground. Sure, if you look at the critic scores and awards, you might think it's a masterpiece. Across the board, 10 out of 10s, and greatest game of all time awards. But it has never released a piece of DLC, and they never even released the multiplayer expansion that they promised, and they quickly announced they were going to remake Last of Us 1 into Engine with two gameplay. Yeah, it's pretty obvious even they know it was not exactly as uh, well received as they wanted. For now, we're focusing on the show which was met with similar acclaim, and I seriously don't understand why. <laughs> the Last of Us series is one of the most middling shows I have watched. There are moments that are genuinely fantastic, stacked right up next to the dumbest, most agonizing bullshit. To the point that the comparison I used to describe this show to people is Walking Dead Season 3. Not as good as Season 1, not as bad as Season 2, but has the highs and lows of each. The good parts are genuinely great, to the point I was actually invested in watching the series. But the low points were so bad, I actually had to force myself to stop laughing at moments that were meant to be taken dead fucking serious. And this isn't even talking about the story, at least not fully. Even the production design can fluctuate between episodes. To such a degree, I was genuinely confused if each episode's director just weren't sharing notes between each other. There are entire creative decisions that can shift. In order for you guys to get what I mean, let's go through each episode and talk about specific parts and what stood out. I promise we won't take too long. 
and I'll address all the famous parts that everyone likes to rant about. In fact, I have some hot takes of my own. It's gonna be... well, y you'll see. So episode 1 is a rough recreation to the first hour or two of the game, with some catches. For those that didn't play Last of Us, the game opens on the night of the apocalypse, a few hours before things kick off. It focuses on Joel's daughter, Sarah, who stayed up past her bedtime in order to make sure she gives her dad a birthday present. After that, Joel puts her to sleep and she wakes up sometime later, noticing that Joel isn't home anymore and foreboding clues are scattered around the house, such as a news report talking about a violent riot, Joel receiving messages his brother Tommy sent about something urgent, and then seeing her father return home covered in blood. It's a slow, creeping section that quickly ramps up with the first reveal of the infected. One of their neighbors bursts into the house, and Joel is forced to shoot him dead. After this is when shit goes south fast. Well, the show actually takes even more time to build up the outbreak, which I'm fine with, to a point. There's an issue I have with the show that comes up more than once, where it takes ideas and elements from the game and boils them down to be as heavy-handed and simple to understand as possible. For example, when you first start the game, you have zero clue what causes Cordyceps to mutate or how it spread so fast, just that it did, and the characters have to find a way to react to it. It's only later in the game can you pick up clues that sort of hint to what could have caused it, but it wasn't the point. Cordyceps happened and the world just has to deal with it. The show decided to actually sit down and explain what caused everything. Some of it was clever, but personally it dips way too hard into just explaining an element that never needed it. First episode opens up with a talk show hosting a debate, and this segment takes place in 1968. The guests debate over what disease could cause the most damage to the world, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, and one of the guests proposes that a fungus could cause the most, as there's no treatment for it, and some have evolved to completely take over the mind and body of the infected. Cordyceps, he's talking about Cordyceps. While they're certain that things are safe since the human body is too warm for the fungus to survive in, the guests suggest that the fungus can mutate if the planet became slightly warmer. What if, for instance, the world were to get slightly warmer? Well, now there is reason to evolve. Essentially saying that global warming is what caused Cordyceps to mutate. Now I don't know about you, but that's so underwhelming compared to simply not knowing. Using global warming as the excuse behind why a virus or monster is unleashed is such a cliché. Now it's not even funny, it's something that every fucking horror movie does. And it's something that rips away the mystery behind how all this happened. Now I am fine with the talk show segment, at least on paper. It is clearly a reference to the intro to Dawn of the Dead, which also started with a talk show talking about the appearance of zombies and their capability of wiping out the human race. They kill for one reason. They kill for food. They eat their victims, you understand that, Mr. Berman? That's what keeps them going. The problem is that instead of being about the reaction to the situation, since it takes place long before the outbreak, it literally just tells you how the zombies in this series are going to work. They're controlled by a fungus that compels them to spread as far as possible. And to take it a step further, it even explains how it spread as fast as it did. Throughout the first episode, there's numerous references to bread. Sarah wanted to make Joel pancakes for his birthday, but he forgot to buy the mix at the store. Their neighbor is eating biscuits with his mother. When Sarah goes to spend time with him, the neighbor's wife insists she takes a batch of cookies with her. There's multiple references to grain food, so the foreshadowing is pretty blatant. The fungus contaminated the bread. Alright, decent enough explanation, and to the first episode's credit, it doesn't outright tell you. It says how it's able to spread as far as it can in a pretty logical way. The problem is that you're bombarded one after the other with this. It really wants you to notice bread. And the issue is that if they just had one reference, I'd be perfectly fine. I'd actually think it was smart. Keep the biscuits one, because it explains the events later in the episode, and it's a subtle enough suggestion. But having the pancake conversation, then the biscuits, and then even the cookies, it's a little too much, you know? Especially since the episode afterwards handles it far better with more subtlety. And to make it even worse, an episode way later also has a conversation that directly explains fungus contaminated the bread supply that was shipped across the world. Cordyceps mutated. Some of it got into the food supply. Probably a basic ingredient like flour or sugar. What makes stories like The Road or Children of Men interesting is that they don't explain what caused the apocalypse. It just happens, and life has to find a way to move on. Twenties later did explain that the virus came from biotesting on monkeys, but they didn't sit down and explain exactly how the virus spread or anything like that. Just that it spreads like wildfire and took the country over in less than a month. HBO Last of Us explaining every detail of how the fungus broke out feels like the writers are scared that the audiences wouldn't get it, and felt the need to literally sit them down and go, okay, Cordyceps evolved because global warming. The fungus contaminated a bread factory and that shipped out across the world, and if you eat the bread you'd become a zombie. 
All right, did you get it? If they were scared of somebody pointing out a plot hole or anything like that, then they missed the point. Yeah, the outbreak is fantastical and doesn't make sense. Everyone accepts that going in because it's the price you pay to get into the story. Magical realism is a thing, and can be used to justify all sorts of stuff. The key is to keep it balanced when you want a grounded story. Another issue I had is that the production design is... weird. Like, here's what I mean. Okay. So when the apocalypse kicks off, Sarah actually goes to see her neighbors to make sure they're okay. But she walks in on the old lady of the family after she bit her son. And she's currently in the process of biting his wife. Now, they really wanted to push this mycelium tendril thing with the infected in the first few episodes. Since you see a bunch of tentacles falling out of the old lady's mouth after biting into the wife. And well... Look at her. I mean, actually really look at her. She just bit two people. Yeah, this is the reveal of the infected. She's completely clean, no blood covering her face or noticeable disfigurements to her whatsoever. She just has some tentacles poking out of her mouth. It's so... underwhelming, especially compared to some zombie designs out there. The reveal of the infected in the original Last of Us is far more intense. The neighbor is clearly disfigured, he's running and screaming, and throws himself through the glass door. Jimmy! Jimmy, stay back! Jimmy, I am warning you! You immediately see the 28 Days Later influence, and understand with a single scene that these things are dangerous. Double dose of Saul, bitches. Look at the zombies from something like Train to Busan. They are gnarly looking. Their faces are swollen, veins dark and bulging out, they're smeared in blood. Just looking at the zombies is enough to unnerve you. Later designs look far better, but also drop the tendril mouth thing, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. Also, the actual shit falling apart sequence is very rushed, like they fucking speed through the events of the intro. Granted, they couldn't have spent a whole episode on it, actually they could have, but we talk about that when we get to the shit episodes, but the point is they wanted to get through the intro in order to get this stuff shown off in the trailer. Like they removed Tommy saving Joel's ass more than once and he's able to outrun the infected by going through one building. Also, the military guy has a jeep now, so now I have to ask the question of why is he alone? You have a whole vehicle with you and you have to secure a perimeter so no one can leave town. Why aren't you with the team? In the game, he's literally just standing out there by himself in the middle of nowhere. It's easier to justify that maybe he got separated or was given his own sector to clear. You get the point of the scene and understand what's trying to do. This is right outside a town full of flesh-eating zombies, like literally they're staring at a building a stone's throw away. Small details matter, and you'll see stuff like this stack up as things go on. Now the other part that weirded me out came after the intro. By the way, Sarah dies. Yeah, it's not as good as the game, because like I said, it feels pretty rushed, and while I do like Pedro Pascal as Joel, he just didn't feel as natural or bitter like how Troy Baker was in the game. Anyway, you jump 20 years in the future. Society is now either open wildlands full of bandits or quarantine zones under the control of Fedra, basically FEMA. And Fedra is a mixed bag. On one hand, they're vicious to the people and abusive, and on the other, they're all that's left holding society in place. You do see some examples of their corruption and how they treat citizens under their protection. In fact, there's a later episode that really had potential to explore how the war between the Fireflies and Fedra is way messier than even established in the game, but it kind of chickens out and focuses on something completely different instead. Regardless, they do a job of establishing the culture of a quarantine zone. It's dirty, crowded, full of wounded people, Fedra soldiers are corrupt and buying drugs off smugglers, they make it clear this is not a safe place to be. Yet it's also one of the last bastions of civilization. So despite the brutal military occupation, you can understand how it's a legitimate way to live in this world. Because it's either deal with the scary guys with guns, or take your chances with the zombies outside. But episode 1 is where you get into some downright... weird changes. For one, the driving force behind why Joel goes on the journey to leave Boston. In the show, it's because he loses contact with Tommy, who talked with him on the radio before going silent for over three weeks. Yeah, Joel and Tommy are still pretty tight in this version, which is... strange. Because if you remember in the game, their relationship is a fucking powder keg. They still love each other as brothers, but Tommy resents Joel for resorting to extremely violent and fucked up things in order to keep both of them alive. This is how you gonna repay me, huh? Repay you? For all those goddamn years I took care of us. Took care. That's what you call it? I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me! It wasn't worth it. I bring you the cure from mankind, and you wanna play the pissy little brother?
Not to mention that Tommy went on to join the Fireflies, which Joel sees as a bunch of idealistic morons. They very much were not on speaking terms. In fact, Joel going to see Tommy to get directions to the university in the game was basically a massive Hail Mary, because Tommy barely wanted anything to do with them. Having them be closer waters down the idea that Joel is a ruthless survivor who did terrible things. And it's weird, because the show explicitly doubles down on this very concept more than once. So they want to convince you that Joel is basically hellbound and an evil man, yet in the same breath, took steps to make his life less of a fucked up mess than it was in the game, where he essentially pushed away any relationship he had left, and was stuck with nothing but tense alliances to keep him company. And speaking of which, this episode also introduces Tess, who is played by Anna Tori. You actually see her after being jumped by Robert's guys, and this is another weird change. So in the game, the implication was that Tess was jumped with the intention of killing her, because Robert sold the guns he promised her and Joel to the Fireflies to use in their war, just that she managed to fight them off and return to Joel. In the show, they change it to be Joel and Tess trying to buy a car battery off Robert, since Joel wants to sneak out of the Boston Quarantine Zone and find Tommy, but Robert already made a deal to sell the battery to the Fireflies. It's basically the exact same setup, just changing the guns to a car battery, but they change how they attack Tess, now they directly capture her and take her to Robert. Since he's scared of retaliation by Joel, and wants Tess to promise that he won't come after Robert and his gang. It's a weird conversation, because if you're so scared of the guy, why would you not just directly kill Tess? You already attacked her and fucked them over on the battery deal. Of course the guy is going to be pissed and take a shot at you. At least if you tried to kill her, there was a chance you could cover the whole thing up. Maybe even set Joel up for an ambush and take him out too, since he wouldn't have a partner to watch his back. I don't know, this whole conversation plays into something I kept noticing in the show, with how they want to portray Joel versus how the rest of the world portrays violence. I'll talk about it when we get to the episodes that actually ended up really being good, since it felt like it took this very idea and spun it on its head, at least how I saw it personally. Regardless, yeah, you get this scene where Robert tells Tess to beg Joel not to come after them, and the whole room explodes due to a firefly attack with Tess having to run back to her and Joel's hideout in the middle of a shootout between Fireflies and Fedra. Once again, nice to see how this war essentially drags unaffiliated parties into things, and they even directly show that the Fireflies are losing support and seen as nothing but trouble by the rest of the quarantine zone. Don't worry, I don't want anything. But if you're feeling lost... You tell me to look for the light and I'll break your jaw. The episode also introduces Marlene and Ellie, both major characters for the rest of the story. Funny enough, Marlene is played by Meryl Dandridge, the actress that played her in the game as well, which is a cool touch, not gonna lie. There's actually more than a few actors from the game in the show, like Ashley Johnson, the original actress for Ellie, and even Troy Baker. But the first episode sets up how the Fireflies held Ellie in captivity ever since discovering her immunity, and that the terror attack you see was actually part of a larger plan to distract Fedra while they snuck out of the quarantine zone. I actually like the segments with the Fireflies, since it never really tries to romanticize them or play them off as explicitly in the right. They believe they're in the right, but they're also bashing their head against the wall and slowly dying out. Marlene herself even comments that they're not really accomplishing anything. Are we winning? Are we beating Fedra here? Are the Fireflies beating Fedra anywhere? Rebellion takes time. If you fight for 20 years and you get nowhere, you're not a rebellion. You're just spray paint. It goes out of its way to show Ellie is their last resort, which is why they have a reverence for her, since if she dies, they have to go back to bombing supply depots and earning the scorn of the public they want to save. Now I know some people have serious feelings about Bella Ramsey. Some think she's a great pick for Ellie, and others, not so much. Personally, I think she mostly does a good job. Parts where she goes out of her way to be a shit talker can be annoying, mainly in the first two episodes but she does reach a point where she sort of loosens up and embodies the dumb teenager vibe that Ellie is supposed to have, liking corny jokes and not really understanding the constant danger looking all around them. Some say that she goes out of her way to neuter Joel or talk down to him, but personally I never felt anything like that. Sure, she shit talks him in the beginning, but they're also complete strangers and don't trust each other. It's in character she would take a chance to talk smack, since she does have an attitude problem. And later on in the series, you do see her naturally fit closer to how Ellie acts in the original game. Hell, she even outright defends Joel when other characters insult him. The last change they make that I thought was interesting was at the very end. So them getting out of Boston plays out mostly the same. Tess and Joel run into Fireflies trying to get their shit back, they find out about Ellie, and they make a deal to smuggle her to the state building, the whole nine yards. Well, when they get outside and get caught by Fedra, they change it to be just one guy who Joel actually did a deal with earlier in the episode. This time, when he finds out Ellie's infected, he holds a gun on them all, 
causing Joel to flash back to when Sarah died and sending him into a violent rage, savagely beating the man to death before coming back to his senses. And after that, they flee the city. The first episode does set the stage for the rest of the show. Pretty well done moments next to goofy ones, next to just baffling changes. I did like the sequence at the end, even if I thought them flashing back to Sarah's death was... a bit too on the nose. It already visually looked like the same shot from how Joel is positioned and the soldier shining the light on them, so them literally snapping the same shot in place felt a bit too much like, do you get it? I clapped! I clapped when I saw it! Still, plenty of people won't and did not in fact care. Fully admit, this is a personal preference thing. So, episode 2 actually ended up being one of the most interesting to talk about. It's probably the second best representation of the game and the vibe that Last of Us is supposed to have, even down to how the episode begins. I said before that there was a better version of the talk show idea that came after the first episode, and this is what I mean. The episode starts in Indonesia right as the outbreak there is beginning. It follows a fungal expert that is suddenly picked up by the police and taken to a lab, where they're studying the corpse of a woman that suddenly went insane and started attacking her co-workers. They took a sample of her blood and found that she is carrying a mutated form of the cordyceps fungus. I like this sequence a lot because it tells you all you need to know about how the outbreak works and how it's spread. The attack happened at a grain factory, so you can assume these supplies contaminated. Multiple workers were bitten, so you can see that the fungus is spreading. You even find out that the woman herself was bitten, so they don't even know who the real Patient Zero actually is. They go so far as to have the fungal experts say that cordyceps can't survive in the human body, and the government workers have no answer for her. They never try to explain it or offer an explanation. Yeah, it makes no sense that this is happening. That's the fucking problem. If this was the intro to the first episode, I would have been more than satisfied. Hell, it's basically a complete retread to the talk show. They cover the same points. Cordyceps can't infect humans, but if it did, we're fucked. There's no treatment for fungal infections, meaning there's no real way to contain a mass outbreak. It feels like they couldn't decide which one they would start the show with, so they said fuck it and did both, which feels a tad redundant. And it makes sense when you consider who one of the showrunners is, and one of the complaints of Last of Us 2 being the structure was all over the place. We'll talk about that later. After the intro, you get a pretty faithful adaptation to the journey to the statehouse from the game, though compressed and removing some of the building spelunking, which in all honesty was there for padding. I actually like this sequence, since it's a good introduction to how fucked the world has become since the intro. They really nail how the world of Last of Us is supposed to look. Everything is dusty and dirty, the buildings are broken down and filled with mushroom colonies. They even show off interesting details to how the infected act when they're alone. They really do resort to just being puppets to the fungus, even gathering in hordes and laying out in the open sun to catch the sunlight, since the needs of the host aren't a factor. The Cordyceps doesn't give a shit if their meat puppet dies. If anything, they kinda want that, because then it can feed off its flesh and spread, which is the goal in the first place. Now, I know it was pretty contentious that they removed the idea of spores, as in the clouds of spores that you would have to walk through in the game with a gas mask. I do think that is dumb, because, hey, you're kinda removing the chance for some creative set pieces, but it is what it is. Even if the excuse was realism, since, no, no, I'm not gonna buy that. Now, there is a pretty dumbass interpretation going around that says the infected won't try to fight anyone not getting in the way of spreading the fungus. I have no idea what butt fucking dumbass spread that idea around, because the infected never act like that in the show. They're your traditional fast-paced zombies, hungry for flesh and on a mission to spread across the world. Only a fucking moron would try to say something like zombies don't get violent if you don't fight the zombie. Oh. Oh, Neil said that. Oh. Oh, Yeah, we're gonna talk about that towards the end, but Druckmann seriously is his own worst enemy, actively getting in the way of his own genuine talent. The guy is desperate to be hailed as a genius who's not like anyone else, to the point that he stumbles around like an idiot. He does have good ideas. You find out that the infected like to stay in cities and are slowly growing a massive fungal network that essentially act like a security system. Stepping on the wrong route alerts every infected in the area, and they'll come running at you screaming and hungry. I love the idea since it's a really creative implementation of the zombie fungus concept, to the point that I quite literally despise this interview where Neil tries to retcon how the infected think to be this weird just don't start the fight idea. Cause this explanation was used to excuse a certain plot point at the very end of the episode. As stated, it's a pretty faithful adaptation to the journey to the statehouse. There's even a sequence that revealed the iconic clicker infected. Zombies that have spent so long infested with cordyceps that it's starting to take over their body, splitting their heads open and rendering them blind. 
The fight with the clickers is a great action scene. It's very fast paced and urgent, with the trio focusing harder on just getting the hell out of there instead of risking getting bitten. There's a reason people liked this episode a lot, because this is the vibe Last of Us needed to match. The problem is what happens after this. They make it to the state house, and it's basically the exact same scene. The fireflies are all dead, and they're left clueless on what to do next. You also find out Tess has been bitten, and demands Joel finish the journey as a final request. But they change the rest of the ending. In the game, Fedra formed a team to track them down, and corners the trio at the state house. Tess decides to sacrifice herself to buy them some time, going down in a blaze of glory, as Fedra executes her. It's a grim sequence that really illustrates how quick and cold death is in the world of Last of Us. There's no sad music or attempt to impress you with how Tess dies. You just see her body on the floor with soldiers barging into the building. The show changes this, to instead have a horde of infected be alerted to their presence and attack the statehouse. Tess decides to stay behind his bait and use the drums of fuel as explosives to kill the horde. And I have serious problems with how this plays out. It insists upon itself, Lois. What? It insists upon itself. What does that even mean? For one, having her death be so bombastic completely plays against what made it work in the game. No, Tess didn't get to go out like a badass. It was the exact opposite. It was a desperate move to buy Joel and Ellie a few extra seconds, and essentially let her suicide by cop. It's not so dramatic and loud. You don't even see her die, you just hear the gunfire. We'll go upstairs. How do we get out from there? Copy that. Oh my god. You, take out the door. Tess. You, with me. Yes, sir! This also helps push the idea of Fedra being a violent and ruthless faction. You understand that they're oppressive and willing to shoot you and characters you like, so you actually start sympathizing with the Fireflies. Maybe they do have a point, and getting Ellie to them would make things better. Of course, that's not what it turns out being. I'm talking about the very beginning of the story. Now, changing it to be in the Infected isn't the worst idea, since it also shows you the dangers of the Infected and adds a personal tragedy that, once again, gives a hint to the ideas that maybe the Fireflies have a point. We could make a cure and make sure this never happens again, that sort of deal. The problem I have is how it's handled. They go out of their way to indulge on Tessa's death. You see her spilling the barrels on the floor, the horde barging into the building, and the worst part of it, an Infected slowly walking up to Tess and infecting her with a kiss. Yes, they literally give Tess a kiss of death. They even do the fake-out thing where you don't know if she'll be able to flick the lighter in time to explore the fuel or not. Spoiler, she does. I really hate how this is handled. It feels so heavy-handed and dramatic compared to the ruthless and downright empty feeling that the game had. What made the game death interesting was specifically how it avoided these exact cliches. You didn't have that dun 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 action score. It never tried to fake out on whether or not her plan would work, because she never had one to begin with, it wasn't the point. Having her die in this explosion feels like they quite literally dumbed down her death scene to make audiences happy, which is ironic considering that a lot of the people involved treat video games as just a stepping stone into real media work. Hell, the fake-out with the lighter is especially annoying because there were boxes of grenades she could have used instead. So now I'm left screaming, why didn't she just use that to blow them all up? It's the same principle, so long as the barrels explode too. Also, yes, the kiss is ridiculous. It's clearly trying to be this surreal metaphorical deal. As stated, it's a kiss of death. We fucking get it. The problem is that we're given zero buildup or establishment that zombies are capable of behavior like this. Everything we see them do before is act like a zombie horde, surround people, and bite them. They're fucking zombies. As much as it might boil Neil's piss to use the Z word. That's the Z word. Don't say it. Why not? Because it's ridiculous. In all fairness, Craig Mazin came out and said the word was never banned. And the showrunners called the infected zombies all the time on set. So, take the articles from February with a grain of salt. Get over it. They're zombies. It's not immediately schlock to admit and embrace that. You literally pay tribute to Dawn of the Dead in the fucking premiere of the show. So, this winds up just being fucking whiplash. We go from 28 Days Later to The Crazies, which are completely different stories with different rules. Now, this is where that explanation from the interview comes into play, since people did point out how weird the sequence is. And frankly, it only makes it worse since it's a vague rule that doesn't make sense that isn't even being used in the rest of the series. It's like how Zack Snyder retconned Darkseid not knowing Earth had the mother boxes because he just forgot that Earth was the first planet he ever suffered a defeat at. I'm not kidding, that was the actual explanation. It was that bad. But yeah, aside from the ending, Episode 2 is actually pretty good. But Episode 3, okay. 
Episode 3 is the interesting one. I have heard nothing but praise for Episode 3. One of the best episodes of the show, an emotional masterpiece, nothing like it has ever been released, greatest of all time TV, and personally, it's the worst of the entire season. Yeah, I'm gonna go that far. The only things that come close are specific moments in other episodes, mere moments compared to an entire episode of preachy frustration. All right, so episode three is the Bill episode. For those that don't recall, once Joel and Ellie escape Boston, they make it to Lincoln, which is still in Massachusetts. They need to track down an associate of Joel's named Bill, who is a paranoid survivalist that has booby-trapped the entire town to be his personal hideout, even weaponizing the infected to keep outsiders away from his town. It's a tense sequence, since Bill and Joel are far from good friends and forced into a very dangerous situation. In fact, Joel basically has to guilt trip him due to still owing the guy a favor. The three work together to fight their way through the town and eventually retrieve a battery, discovering that Bill's boyfriend Frank stole it when he ran away as one last fuck you to the guy before he was killed by the infected, being bitten and choosing to commit suicide rather than turn. It is a great sequence, and it shows the effects of an isolated lifestyle. Bill became deranged and outright talks to himself after spending so much time alone. His relationship with Frank shows what happens when you push everyone out of your life, becoming consumed with that kill-or-be-killed survivalist mindset. It also helps that W. Earl Brown gives a fantastic performance as Bill. He is a great actor, and I recommend you all to sit down and watch Deadwood, since he plays one of the best characters in the show, Dan Doherty. You ought to pin that on your chest. You hypocrite enough to wear it. If I had one that works, which I sure as hell don't, what makes you think I'd just give it to you? Huh? Yeah, sure, Joel. Go ahead. Take my card. Take all my food, too, while you're at it. By the looks of it, you could lose some of that food. You listen to me, you little shit. No, fuck you! Also, he's Kentucky-born, too, so that's pretty cool. Now, the show changes pretty much every detail. Bill is now played by Nick Offerman, who isn't a bad choice. And I am still sad that there couldn't be at least a cameo for Earl. The guy was a powerhouse. He was one of the characters in the game. But Offerman himself is more than capable of handling serious drama. Don't believe me? Watch Devs. I don't even really like that show, but he was fantastic in it. Though, if we're gonna be honest here, most of you guys will never not be listing off Ron Swanson quotes in your head, especially with the character that Bill is in the show. Categories include capitalism, God's way of determining who is smart and who is poor. Bill in the show is a doomsday prepper, someone that's been expecting the end of the world since before the actual end of the world, and treats the apocalypse as him finally being proven right. In the beginning, he thinks it's all just New World Order Death Squad shuffling his neighborhood off to be killed, and he's not wrong but he quickly realizes the truth of the situation and is able to ride out the apocalypse in relative comfort. It's a fun sequence full of dark humor. It helps scratch that literally me survivalist fantasy that people have when they think about zombie stories. The problem is when the actual plot starts, when Bill meets Frank. Now, we never find out much about Frank in the game. He was Bill's partner, who ran off thanks to Bill becoming a deranged shut-in that refuses to interact with the rest of the world. The most you get out of his character is in his suicide note, where he's bitter about life with Bill, and just outright tells him to kiss his ass. The show taking the time to flesh out their relationship and explore more about who they really are is a good idea, to see how this partnership fell apart and how it ripped apart Bill and turned him into the man we see in the game. Oh wait, the show doesn't do that. Yeah, nothing like that happens. In fact, they go out of their way to avoid any sort of conflict of that nature. Bill and Frank's relationship is quite literally meant to be a pitch-perfect romance story. And this isn't me speculating, this is something the director of the episode flat out admitted, stating that the goal was to trick audiences into watching a gay romance. The show is meant to be for adults. The episode is all about how Bill and Frank fall in love and spend 20 years together until both choose to commit suicide once Frank develops a terminal illness. Yeah, Bill dies. He dies before Joel and Ellie ever get to them. Now, I've mentioned before, I really don't like the idea of representation, specifically because any group you want to represent has to adhere to whatever the most popular stereotype is in order for audiences to get what you're selling. Not only that, but they have to be held to a different standard because this isn't a character that can make a mistake, because they're not a character. They're a symbol. They represent a larger group. Bill and Frank represent gay men. They can't just be two guys who happen to be gay like they were in the game. Because of that, their personalities are sanded down to be as safe and harmless as possible. Bill in the game flat out murders people to keep them away from his town, using zombies as weapons and other assorted fucked up traps. He's meant to be unstable and not really trustworthy. All right. You're gonna check your barricades again. You neglect the simple shit and now you're paying for it. You know what that means? Taking all the supplies from the warehouse and okay. going into the east fence to again. And then it'll take you. Bill! Joel! This way. 
But when you make a show with the goal of tricking audiences into watching a gay romance, you can't have this. Bill isn't allowed to be a ruthless lunatic because then you're saying all gay people are ruthless lunatics, no matter the context or the setting. So him and Frank have this outright two-dimensional romance that feels cheap. As much as people say that this is Nick Offerman's best role, you really don't see it in the show. Because for one, he barely fucking talks. He just sort of reacts to whatever Frank is doing. Bill in the beginning is interesting, seeing him set up his defenses and get to live out his prepper dream. But once Frank shows up, he becomes a completely different character, inviting a stranger into his home and feeding him, and then suddenly letting the guy seduce him. And I do mean seduce, because apparently playing the piano for a minute or two is enough to get Bill to sleep with a guy he pointed a gun at not even an hour beforehand. You'd think a guy as paranoid as Bill would take this as a sign that the guy is trying to get him to lower his guard, maybe make him vulnerable to an ambush by raiders? But no, they just fall in love after a single dinner. Frank even does shit like use the radio to contact people on the outside without Bill's knowledge. I've actually been talking to a nice woman on the radio. You what?! Something that Game Bill would absolutely kill somebody for, since even if Frank had good intentions and trusted who he was talking to, it wouldn't mean that the other party was actually who they said they were. It's extremely stupid to just suddenly start talking to outsiders without any communication to the rest of your group. And the worst part is, they play it off like a fucking sitcom joke. It's defanging the danger, despite Bill's paranoia being a legitimate mindset to have in this setting, and the worst part is, they eventually do get attacked by raiders. And the attack is pretty fucking dumb too. The flamethrower sprinklers? Those are cool. That feels like something a survivalist would actually figure out and use. But Bill standing in the middle of the street and taking pot shots at the bad guys with a fucking bolt-action rifle is ridiculous. If he wanted to use that gun, have him set up on a rooftop or snipe from a window. Something where he has a good position and they can't see him. If he wanted to stand in the street, let him have an automatic rifle, like an AK or an M4, since that means he has fire superiority and the raiders simply wouldn't be able to keep up with him between the flamethrowers and the gunfire, but a bolt action is slow as hell, meaning they have plenty of time to line up shots, which is exactly what happens. It just goes completely against the rugged survivalist character that he's supposed to be. Bill would not make such a basic mistake. Of course, this episode actually has a lot of those. Like, there are actually points where I was convinced the director or the writer or whoever forgot that people could die in this show. The worst one is in the beginning, before the flashback where it's still about Joel and Ellie. Uh, Joel throws away an M4 because, and I quote, it doesn't have ammo. There's not much ammo out there for this thing. Makes it mostly useless. Pedro, that thing fires 556 ammo, the most plentiful round on the planet. There are factories actively still making these bullets and supplying Fedra with them. Fedra's got a factory down there in the QZ. Supposedly only makes two things, pills and bullets. You're gonna find a cache if you look even after 20 years. He's also going to Bill's compound, a survivalist who has entire stashes of guns and ammo. This was definitely a moment that reminded me this show is written by Californians who don't understand guns. Because if they wanted to get rid of the M4 and make Joel more vulnerable, they could have come up with a way better excuse. Hell, Joel dropped it during the fight with the clickers just the episode before. Established that something in the gun broke, like the trigger or even the barrel became bent. Something that renders it actually useless. Because even without ammo, there's a lot you can do with the rifle. A big one being, you can fake out human attackers. All he has to do is make them think it was loaded. Father and the Road outright made wooden bullets just to make it look like his revolver had shots. Just so he could fake out bandits. And if he is not the word of God... And God never spoke. Granted, this does jack shit with the infected, but they make it clear past a point that human raiders are a bigger deal. And a rifle is even easier to fake since nobody can physically see if the gun is loaded or not like a revolver. The only one who knows would be Joel. But back on point, Bill and Frank both kill themselves. Uh, Frank develops cancer, and Bill decides that he's too old to find anyone else to care about, so they commit suicide and leave their belongings to Joel and Ellie. Bill even writing a note telling Joel to find a reason to live like he did. Honestly, I really could not stand this episode. It felt super out of left field, and really didn't serve any purpose. Like, what was the point of fleshing out Bill? In the grand scheme, it serves nothing. He dies as a result of a very lukewarm romance that you don't even get time to see develop. And I mean, actually develop. They rush through the beginning of the relationship just to get to these two old boomers acting all lovey-dovey, even giggling like schoolgirls while eating strawberries. There's no grit or any attempt to actually make you care, just telling you that you should because it's two people in love during the apocalypse. And not gonna lie, 
There were multiple moments where I could have sworn they just repurposed a rejected Walking Dead episode, because that's exactly what it felt like at times. Even visually, it kinda looked like Walking Dead. The neighborhood was way too clean for the time frame they wanted to sell. The beginning, when everything kicks off, I can buy. But they really needed to show the decay starting to set in as the years went by. Sure, they bullshit an explanation that Frank was going around fixing up buildings, but we're talking about 20 years worth of time. Think about all the shit that could be broken or fallen into disrepair in a single year alone. And some of that damage can require entire crews of guys to fix. The idea that two old dudes could handle that amount of work with no issue? That's just fantasy. Once again, they remove a chance for really compelling story moments for the sake of a perfect zombie romance. Like maybe after Frank gets sick, you can see the town starting to fall apart. As much as they tried to stave it off, nature is creeping into their little paradise. Maybe even have it coincide with Bill and Frank getting angrier with each other, fighting and arguing more often. Frank wants to give up and die, while Bill insists on staying alive just for living's sake. Maybe even convincing himself that they can track down a doctor or medicine, but it's really all cope since it comes down to him thinking that he worked too hard to simply give up and let what they built fall to the bandits or the infected. You see the separation between someone prepared to die and someone who's completely ingrained in fighting for every single breath. That just so happens to mirror a certain other plot point towards the end of the story, by the way. Then it can end with Bill realizing that he doesn't want to kill Frank, because then he would be all alone in the world. So he decides that since Frank is the dead man either way, he would join him, and the two can kill themselves like they do at the end of the episode. Just adding some form of a conflict between these two adds more punch to the emotional moments. But how it is in the show just feels so fake. Especially it doesn't help that the director of the episode did that interview, since now I can't help but feel everything there is done to quite literally manipulate the audience. Now storytelling is all about manipulating an audience. You're trying to get them to pay attention, wonder what happens next, and feel certain emotions at certain times. But there's a point where it dips into full-blown manipulation, that you're forcing emotions instead of letting the audience feel them naturally. And episode 3 absolutely does this in my opinion. What makes it even worse is that really, there isn't a point to it either. Bill in the game is supposed to represent who Joel could have become if he kept down his path that he would push people away and be stuck with nothing but raiders and the infected. This type of life drains you and eventually turns you into a fucking psycho killer. A life that really isn't worth living. Which is where Ellie comes in, the second chance at being a father that Joel wanted but is scared to admit, since he could lose her to something as simple as Ellie taking the wrong step at the wrong time. But with how much episode 3 differs from the Lincoln section in the game, all of this is thrown out the window, instead trying to say that Joel should find someone to care about. Like Bill did. Which... we know. All you're doing is literally spilling the theme of the story out. And Bill killed himself at the end, along with Frank, so... Not really sure that he's the best example to live by, I mean... Since it's basically saying if you lose the person that makes life worth living, you should just kill yourself. Which, uh... Not really the best advice, considering Joel's history. Your life is nothing! You serve zero purpose! You should kill yourself now! The biggest plot point in the episode is that Ellie and Joel find a truck, which is in mint fucking condition, by the way. Outright shiny with a fresh coat of paint. I remind you all, 20 years. Even the truck they get in the game looks beaten down and like it barely fucking works. Just the fact it moves is more than enough of a reward to make the journey worth it. Now, I'm gonna lop the next two episodes together as essentially one big section, since the issues I have affect both episodes. And it's only really big things I took notes on. So episode 4 and 5 focus on what would be the Philadelphia segment in the game. It's Pittsburgh, you fucking retard. I say would because they actually change it to take place in Kansas City. No clue why, my assumption is they wanted to speed things along so that Joel and Ellie are already close to their destination, or maybe wherever they filmed was cheaper. It really doesn't matter, honestly. But when they arrive at Kansas, it plays out the ambush scene from the game. The guy pretends to be hurt, Joel recognizes the trap, and they're forced to crash the truck. But there's more than a few changes to the sequence. For one, the number of guys in the ambush is significantly lower. In the game, it's a whole ass army of dudes since it was the remnants of the survivors who lived in the quarantine zone before it collapsed. In this, it's more like two opportunistic kids trying to kill the new outsiders who just showed up. They also remove the glass kill, where a bandit tries to shove Joel onto a piece of broken glass during a struggle, but he reverses it and kills the bandit instead. That's gone now. It's just kind of both sides plinking at each other in the show. 
Also, the Hank Williams is still there, but just used for a road trip montage instead of during the ambush, which makes me sad. I like that a lot in the game. Regardless, Joel manages to shoot one of them while the other flanks around and pins him to the ground, with the full intention of strangling him to death. Ellie actually saves Joel here in a scene that's sort of supposed to be the scene of the game where she shoots the guy drowning him in the puddle. Only this time, she only wounds him. And this is where we get the first thing I talked about, which also plays into that point I brought up earlier about how this show handles violence. After Ellie wounds the bandit, the guy completely pusses out and folds. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's over. We're not fighting anymore. I don't know what to do. My legs don't work. Begging the two not to kill him and that they could be friends. Joel isn't even trying to listen to him, simply getting up off the ground and telling Ellie to go in the other room. I actually really like this segment since it shows exactly how Joel handles being violent. The dude is vicious and can turn into fucking Frankenstein's monster once he's pissed off. But the part that stuck out to me was that they wanted to frame this as something Joel should not have done. Remember back in episode 1 where Robert begged Tess to calm down Joel over the betrayal? This is what I mean when I mentioned that being part of a larger theme with the guy. They really want to push the idea that Joel is the one who perpetuates conflict, that he doesn't know when to just quit and let things go. But here's the thing, every example they use actively makes Joel the good guy. Like, undeniably. Robert fucked them over and tried to kill Tess, and then essentially cried like a bitch to avoid the consequences. Which is ironic, considering he's later killed by the Fireflies for pulling the exact same tactics with them. But the weird part is that Tess does try to convince Joel to let things go, that Robert gets his W and they should move on. It's weird because, in the game, Tess is the one who pushes for them to confront Robert, because she got her ass beat and the asshole stole their guns. At least find out who they were. Yeah, look, they were a couple of nobodies. They don't matter. What matters? is that Robert fucking sent them. Our Robert. He knows that we're after him. He figures he's gonna get us first. Son of a bitch, he's smart. No. He's not smart enough. I know where he's hiding. Hell, she's the one who kills Robert. We get the guns? What do you say? Come on. Yeah, fuck those fireflies. Just go get them. That is a stupid idea. This example here is another case of that. This asshole just tried to murder them. This wasn't a misunderstanding where they assumed they were bandits and were just protecting their territory. He was part of an ambush that specifically relies on manipulating the goodwill of his victim to lure them. They trick people into trying to help a wounded man and then murder them. So this kid crying and screaming about how the fight's over is actually a tad insulting. Because when the shoe was on the other foot, he was downright gleeful about how he was going to kill Joel. You can't just throw your hands up and go, we're friends now, and expect the other party to just give up. And you especially can't say the other party is unreasonable for telling you to go fuck yourself and gutting you. Hell, how are they supposed to trust that your surrender is genuine? What if this is another tactic to make them lower their guard? It makes perfect sense why Joel would execute the guy, because him being dead means his friends know nothing about him and Ellie, and they have that much more time to escape. Could the guy have gone turncoat and genuinely meant that he would help them? Possible. But that also means the guy is an opportunist, which is bad enough. You can't trust him, and if you can't trust him, slit his throat and move on. It sounds cold, or dare I say it, edgy. But with a setting like The Last of Us, this is the mindset you have your characters use, because the tone has already been set to be this grim and grounded look at human brutality. So that means showing situations where characters have to be brutal, and brutality means efficiency. It's simply a situation where the old morality does not apply. Joel isn't automatically evil for assuming it would be a bad idea to let a hostile enemy live, even if they swear they surrender, because that risk could lead to disaster down the line. And the reason I bring this up is because of a certain plot point at the very end that you all know is coming. Trust me, it's gonna be spicy. But Kansas is essentially the show trying to workshop a theme. A specific theme that Neil Druckmann is obsessed with shoving into The Last of Us, anywhere that it can fit. The cycle of vengeance. Yep, Revenge Bad is back. And you have to deal with it for two straight hours. For context, the Kansas City Quarantine Zone was controlled by a particularly brutal chunk of Fedra, outright raping and murdering citizens for fun. This caused a violent revolution to spark up that resulted in the purging of the Fedra soldiers, along with anyone who gave them information on other citizens, referred to as collaborators. On paper, this is a great concept, showing the oppressed victims becoming just as violent and tyrannical as the ones that hurt them, even outright becoming worse since they started ambushing passerbys who had no clue what was going on. In fact, 
This is where Henry and Sam come into play. In the game, they're also just passing through on a mission to track down and join up with the Fireflies. But in the show, they were actually a part of the quarantine zone before it fell. And Henry acted as a collaborator in order to secure medicine for Sam when he developed leukemia. Yeah, for some reason they straight up made Sam develop cancer as a child. Also, he's deaf in the show. I don't know why, but it feels like they outright hate this kid. <laughs> Point is, Henry sold out the leader of the revolution who wanted a more peaceful solution, and that led to him being executed. But it meant Sam could live. And because of this, the leader's sister, a woman named Kathleen, takes over and is the one who leads the revolt. She also becomes obsessed with killing every single collaborator, and especially Henry and Sam. Like, to a downright psychotic degree. She becomes a fucking cartoon villain so obsessed with Henry that she thinks he's responsible for any problems in their territory. Outright thinking that he called Joel and Ellie to the city. She builds them up so much that you think Henry is like a boogeyman or something, then you meet him and he's just some dude. Well, if Henry has a radio, maybe he found someone out there. Maybe he called these guys in. This is Henry's work. Understand? And he won't stop until we stop him. Now, I'm sure fans of the show might go, that's the point, but just because that's what they intended to do doesn't mean they did it right. Because Kathleen was one of the worst parts of this show. Unequivocally. And to the point, I really do feel like the actress was fucked over, both writing and direction-wise. She's such a cliché, obsessed with vengeance villain that you get scene after scene of her trying to spout canned tough guy dialogue, saying she did awful things, and threatening people, and trying to seem intimidating. The problem? Her acting is so god-awful, I was legitimately stunned. Like, actually speechless at how bad it was. There's no way they looked at this and thought, yeah, HR Wine Mom is the vibe we should push for this leader of a violent bandit faction. This is what I mean by the actress got fucked over. Whether it was a direction issue or just a bad case of a miscast, there simply isn't something working here. It falls flat and becomes laughable. The conversation about the thunder had me audibly going, fuck you, over and over again, because I hated her character, and I didn't give a shit. In fact, the very idea of trying to give the bandits a face is a bad idea to begin with. In the game, they were quite literally faceless mooks. Just goons that kill people and try to steal their shit. Now, some people argue they're outright cartoonish in the game, since they do stuff like execute people for their shoes. No! <laughs> Busy couple of days, huh? <sighs> Whatever, man. Damn, no food. Old pair of shoes. We got nothing. Let's go. And all I can say to that is, no, they weren't. Violent thugs truly can be that petty and selfish. They simply killed and they stole. It really wasn't anything more complicated than that. That shit that goes on in the modern world right now. People have the serious issue of wanting to humanize every criminal out there, ignoring situations where somebody is just a total sadist or completely disregards human life. Not every person who shoplifts is stealing a loaf of bread. Sometimes an asshole is just an asshole, and you quadruple that in a situation like The Last of Us. It doesn't matter that they're just trying to survive too, because the one who starts the violence chose to kill and steal. You could have started a farm or learned how to forage, but instead, decide to simply take from someone else. Who gives a shit that these people need to eat? They're murdering others who also need to eat. To give them sympathy is to forget that they started the conflict, and they're crying about the retaliation. So long as they embrace this, just accepting that they are bandits doing bad things, it's easy to not flat out hate them in a bad way. The audience isn't annoyed with them. A very big lesson to take away is don't make a character a hypocrite, unless you want to specifically focus on them being a hypocrite and how that fucks them over, because leaving it unaddressed just pisses everyone off. It's insufferable and kills any point the character could make, since it will forever taint anything they say. Who gives a shit about your brother? You're a hypocrite doing the exact same thing Fedra did to you. There's a reason I bring up the ambush, because that embodies exactly what I'm saying. Yes, Joel is a guy who did some awful shit, but in the situations we see in the story, he's never the one to start the fight, at least not all the time. He simply reacts to being attacked, and at that point, how the fuck do you judge him? Hell, to take it a step further, Joel knows he's a violent man. He embraces it and never tries to paint himself as a hero or act like he's better than anyone. He's not hunting people down for fun, he's just trying not to die. What makes a character like Kathleen insufferable is that they want you to feel bad and sympathize with her. Despite her killing scores of innocent people, taking loved ones away from others like Fedra and Henry did to her. And outright trying to murder a child. A deaf child with cancer, I might add. This is outright cartoon level evil. 
they managed to make the bandits more over the top by trying to humanize them, since it gets to the point that she's throwing away her own self-preservation purely to try and kill Henry and Sam. Like, sending her entire crew after these two, leaving their territory undefended Fury Road style, and not giving a shit that bodies are stacking up. The funny part is that past a point, the sequence in the game does become about the gang trying to avenge their friends, but I repeat, they never try to make you feel bad for them. They are definitely villains who deserve to die for what they've done. A big problem that Druckmann has is that he pushes this cycle of violence idea in the worst way possible. He tries to tackle from the idea of both sides have points, which on paper makes sense. Both sides would have their own perspective on things. The issue is that to have a conflict like what you see in The Last of Us, it requires one side to outright be an asshole, to kick off the violence in order for a cycle to begin. And Neil is not interested in ever actually addressing this aspect. He keeps trying to excuse it or make it seem unreasonable that there would even be a fight about it. To the point it gets confused with what it's even trying to say. Last of Us 2's biggest problem is exactly this, claiming awful people are good deep down purely because they said so, even if their actions show the complete opposite. If you want a series that handles the cycle of vengeance better, watch Beef. It's a miniseries on Netflix that's really good, and go in blind if you can. Not only does it say both sides are assholes, but the entire point is that either could have squashed it at any point, but they chose not to and doubled down because they're awful people. For Last of Us, it's to the point they have Kathleen unironically say that Henry should have let Sam die, actually trying to guilt trip a man for doing anything to save his little brother, who is his only reason to live. And this is played off as a maybe she has a point. I get it, she is meant to be the bad guy, but it is such an over-the-top speech. I know why you did what you did, but did you ever stop to think that maybe he was supposed to die? Well, kids die, Henry. They die all the time. Well, this is what happens when you fuck with fate. Like anyone who said the bandits in the game were two-dimensional probably would have a fucking aneurysm with this chick's logic, because I have seen Bond villains with more humanitarian tendencies. And all leads to the shootout at the very end, where Joel has to cover the rest of the group with sniper fire as bandits and infected come swarming in. Now, I actually like this sequence where both sides accidentally wake up a clicker nest and get completely swarmed. It's a pretty cool scene where they all get overwhelmed by the horde and slaughtered. I like it, mainly because I enjoy these sequences of zombies tearing through a place and causing hell on Earth. A well done sequence can really get your heart pounding. The best examples are Train to Busan, All of Us Are Dead, and Kingdom. Something about Korea and zombies, man, they just know what they're doing. Anyway, but you also get the reveal of the bloater in this scene, which, not gonna lie, is pretty cool. Even if all it does is rip the head off some jobber second-in-command that follow Kathleen around. Still, it was cool to see them actually establish it as a real thing in the show, even though it is completely 100% fanservice. This is all you see the bloater, it never comes into play again. It's honestly just kind of fucking pointless to a degree. Now, some people were worried that it would be left out because it's too video gamey, but no, it's there. Be. And to really drive the point home of Kathleen both being psychotic and stupid, she still holds a gun on the group, still obsessed with revenge, and then getting herself killed when a child clicker blindsides and eats her. It's hard to even say that it's a fitting death, because it's 100% a result of her just being fucking stupid. There was a massive horde of zombies right behind you. The fuck did you think was gonna happen? Anyway, the group gets away and takes shelter away from the city, and everyone already knows what I'm gonna talk about next. Yep. Sam revealing he's been bitten to Ellie. This was another situation where I was honestly baffled at the change, because every single part of it actively makes the story worse. In the game, Sam never reveals that he's been bitten during the sniper fight because he's scared of what will happen to him, and doesn't understand the significance of the situation. The most evidence you get is his conversation with Ellie saying that he's afraid of the idea that the infected are still aware of what's going on around them, and that they're trapped in their body. I'm scared of ending up alone. What about you? Those things out there. What if the people are still inside? What if they're trapped in there without any control of their body? I'm scared of that happening to me. It's vague enough to where you can see how Ellie didn't pick up on the red flags, simply assuming that Sam was freaked out by the events of the day and leaving him alone. We, the audience, see he's been bitten because he pulls his pant leg up to reveal an infected got his leg, and during the shootout, you can spot Sam limping after an infected grabs him. It's kept vague enough to where when the reveal comes, it's a complete oh shit moment. The situation spirals out of control, and Henry puts Sam down, immediately committing suicide afterwards due to not being able to live without his little brother, a foreboding warning about what could happen to Joel if he lost Ellie. 
Now in the show, they do things differently. This time, Sam directly tells Ellie he's been bitten, and she decides to rub her blood on the wound in the belief that it would save his life, which is... <sighs> insanely stupid. Like, unforgivably fucking stupid. Not just because the idea of Ellie's blood being a cure is something that only a complete dumbass would assume, since some people have argued that it was there to disprove that notion, but the sheer fact Ellie would make none of them aware of Sam being bitten. She could have easily gotten everyone killed for literally no reason. Why would she not, at the very fucking least, make Henry aware of what happened to his little brother? Even if you were scared Joel would jump the gun and immediately execute Sam, not making Henry aware is just stupid. And if the point is that Ellie's an idiot, congratulations, you made her look like an idiot. This dips into full-blown plot armor, because she actually falls asleep in the same room, and wakes up in the morning to make sure he's okay, where he just so happens to finally be turning. He could have easily turned at some point in the middle of the night and killed you all in your sleep. He could have ripped Ellie to pieces if she woke up just an hour later. I mean, fuck. Having it be where Ellie falls asleep and manages to wake up just as he's turning feels so much more artificial, since it means this plan requires a lot more moving parts, so it works out in her favor. Having the characters not know relinquishes them of this kind of responsibility, because how could they prepare for something they didn't catch in time? You can't blame Game Ellie for not telling the group something she didn't know, and having her enter the room completely unaware of Sam's condition feels like a much more natural setup to the reveal. It shows how quickly and mercilessly this world can kill even a child, in a very horrific and depressing way as well, turning into a feral zombie and needing to be put down by their older brother, who shoots himself immediately after out of guilt. This is nobody's fault, Henry. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! The dramatic irony works so much better than having Ellie be aware, since that idea raises more questions than outright plot holes, which feeds into that issue I brought up in episode 2, where Neil ends up putting a foot in his mouth trying to explain anything and everything. Now Ellie looks more like an irresponsible dumbass than a naive kid. Thankfully, after this point is where the show slowly starts getting better, though it still has growing pains. Episode 6 is mostly inoffensive, to the point of being kind of boring. It's about when Joel and Ellie make it to Tommy's settlement, which is actually one of my favorite parts in the game, since it's when the two really have to work out what their relationship is, and you get one of the most iconic scenes in the entire fucking franchise. But the show... Well, it has the same problem as episode 1, rushing through elements to fit as much territory as possible, which is a completely self-made issue due to the constant additions of filler scenes, and I do mean filler scenes. Unnecessary flashbacks, giving screen time to jobber characters who are gonna die anyway, and tons of scenes of Joel and Ellie in the woods. I'm actually mostly okay with the final example because it gives time for the characters to connect and bond, and a lot of those end up being the best parts of the show, just seeing Joel and Ellie bounce off each other and their dynamic. And this is important for a series about how these two grow to love one another. The problem is that when it comes time to cash in, they tend to drop the ball. I mentioned it partially with the first episode, how they rush the first infection to the point that you really don't feel anything when Sarah dies, because you barely get the time to process that they need to run before they're stopped by the soldier. It speeds through like their shot's missing. And it's funny in this case because the entire point of this sequence is that they slow down and take their time. The show completely removes the bandit element, where Joel has to help Tommy secure the dam, and they fight through the camp after Ellie runs away. No, they have more time to have these characters really nail the emotional beats. Yet it feels rushed, and like they're on fast forward. You hear it in their cadence, where they actually try to quote the game. Ellie in particular sounds like she's sprinting through the dialogue, to the point she can't add her own personality to it. Like how Ashley Johnson in the game sounds like she's trying not to cry when she says the I'll only be more scared quote. So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else, because the truth is I would just be more scared. Yeah, Bella Ramsey tries, but it just doesn't fit. So don't tell me that I'd be safe with somebody else, because the truth is I would just be more scared. You see Ellie's tough exterior break down, that she's a scared kid looking for someone to help her. Pedro Pascal also really has trouble deciding on whether or not he wants Joel to keep his accent or not, since he fluctuates with it throughout the entire show. And this was a case where it suffers because of this. He knows the area better than I do. Do you give a shit about me or not? Of course I do. Then what are you so afraid of? It sounds more just outright monotone than how Troy Baker in the game sounds, who has a far more commanding and aggressive way of speaking for Joel. I can take care of myself. How many close calls have we had? Well, we seem to be doing all right so far. And now you'll be doing even better with Tommy. 
Now, the rest of the episode is just the two walking around Jackson and seeing how far along Tommy and Maria have been able to keep this place running. It's supposed to show how being part of a community and letting yourself form real connections with others can really fix things, even in a world as broken as The Last of Us. It's actually to the point that this is the real lesson of the story, but we'll talk about that come the finale. I know people got really heated over the line Maria has here. It is that, literally. This is the commune. We're communists. But personally, I never saw it as anything more than Reddit bait to make fat neckbeards happy. Guys, communism is super cool, says the man-child dressed in Star Wars pajamas and drinking an extra-large Coke from McDonald's. It's another case of such a pointless line being shoved in that has little to do with the rest of the story. Now, I didn't mention it earlier, but I actually like Gabriel Luna as Tommy. I feel like he managed to embody an ex-military Texas redneck in a pretty natural manner. The problem is that, once again, having his and Joel's relationship be less cold makes their argument feel softened. In the game, Tommy outright threatened to have Joel killed during an argument. We ain't back in Boston. You lay your hands on me again, it won't end well for you. You saw how Joel's lifestyle took a toll on even the only family he had left, and his journey with Ellie was his chance at redemption. In the show, it paints it more as Maria not liking Joel and turning Tommy against him, which, while she has a point with him being a former bandit, feels more petty, as though Tommy couldn't form his own opinion and be disgusted at what Joel had him do because he chose to. At least with having the two be strained from the get-go, you can see it as Maria siding with Tommy and not trusting the guy that her husband has problems with. Now, I did like how she slips up and mentions Sarah to Ellie, since the game never actually shows this and just has Ellie say Maria told her, painting it more as Maria accidentally mentioning a touchy subject and setting off Ellie's suspicions actually works in my opinion, since at this point the relationship between her and Joel is fracturing, as the events of Kansas kind of fuck the two of them up. After this, they go to the University of Colorado, and they go through that segment. Now the game had to be a whole ass level, even giving Joel a flamethrower to burn away the sinners. Admittedly, it's kind of a filler segment, and I'm fine with them compressing it down to get to the main point. The Fireflies left, and they might have relocated to Salt Lake City. Also, they conveniently left out the detail that the scientists let out a bunch of infected monkeys, because the Fireflies are fucking stupid, but we'll talk about that later. After this, they get jumped by a group of raiders, and... This is a weird case. So in the game, this ends up being a very big moment. Mainly that Joel is injured after getting impaled with rebar, and Ellie has to fight to get the both of them out of there alive. It's another pretty iconic moment for the game, as it fits the first time we've seen Joel about to die and need to be saved. It's actually heartbreaking to see the big guy stumbling around, powerless to do anything as Ellie has to handle most of the fighting for him. The screen gets darker, Joel leaves trails of blood everywhere, even the audio starts to have more of a reverb as he's getting lightheaded. The show, funny enough, downplays this section. Yes, the one time The Last of Us series decided not to indulge itself, and it's for a moment that honestly kind of needed it. For one, the segment is the payoff to multiple hours worth of buildup. We're so used to seeing Joel be the one to protect Ellie, now the shoe is on the other foot, and it takes its time with it, showing Joel in agonizing pain surrounded by bad guys. It really does feel like the two barely managed to scrape out of the situation alive, and it sets the stage for the winner segment. The show, instead, severely limits the number of bandits down to four guys, and completely removes Joel getting impaled. This time bum-rushed by a single dude who manages to stab him before Joel is able to snap his neck. It's such a downgrade that I'm actually left more confused by the end of it. Joel getting injured is one of the most memorable parts of the game. It's one of the emotional moments. So cutting it down to a single guy stabbing Joel feels cheap. Like, literally cheap. Could they just not afford to do the whole sequence like in the game? Is that why the bandits were like four dudes? In general, the production is all over the place post-episode 2. Like, characters are wearing fresh clothes that were just laundered all over the place. Hell, episode 3 was literally just filmed in some guy's house and backyard with minimal set dressing to make it look apocalyptic. It looks way too clean. It really does feel like there are parts where they didn't have the money to emulate the game. It's why you have so many scenes of just Joel and Ellie walking in the woods, because that's cheap to film in. The actual scenes where you see the devastation look great, but I think it resulted in the budget getting stretched thin in places. It explains why the infected can go from looking incredible to looking like an old lady with grass in her mouth. Or in Episodes 3 case, they basically glue some plastic tendrils to the side of this dude's head. But yeah, I fully think they cheapened out on getting Joel injured, which sucks because it's such a great scene in the game. Some might say it's more realistic since they're not fighting a fucking army like in the game, but this was a case where you could suspend realism for the emotional gut punch, especially considering what happens later. So the next episode after this 
is another filler one, much like Bill, but it's actually something canon to the game as well. You get an adaptation to the Left Behind DLC, which explains how Ellie is bitten. And this is gonna be a hot take. I kinda like this episode. To me, this was a sign that the show was starting to pick back up. I absolutely agree that it is in the worst fucking place, especially if you watch this week by week, since this is a whole ass filler episode, a backstory dump, right after a substantial cliffhanger. Of course it'll piss off audiences, especially since some fans flat out fucking hate Left Behind as it is. So having an episode about the DLC coming right after the part where Joel is injured grinds the pacing to a halt, which is something that people complained about with Last of Us 2 as well, that the structure felt all over the place, throwing in flashbacks within flashbacks and the infamous character switch halfway through the game. It's not as bad as that, but I can definitely say it is a flaw with this specific episode, because there's not really an attempt to juxtapose it with the present. The most you get are some quick flashes of Ellie looking for medicine to help Joel, but they're measured in seconds. But when you speed through the show, it's not as bad. You're able to just accept it in the flow and enjoy the episode for what it is. So if you like the Left Behind DLC, it's a good adaptation of that. One that pretty much hits all the major points with only minimal changes, like they don't fight any bad guys or lure the infected to fight them. No, nothing like that. But all the big story moments are adapted pretty much, you know, shot for shot. And that's kind of weird. I mean, I wonder who was in charge of the DLC for Neil not to want to change anything. Still, this has good character moments between Ellie and her friend. The show does a good job of establishing that they are just dumb kids. They get into fights at school, get talked down to by their teachers, and like to break the rules when they feel like they can get away with it. Her friend, Riley, even gets talked into joining the Fireflies, taking advantage of her naivete to essentially become a child soldier. Of course, Fedra quite literally does the same thing as they controlled the school system and turned it into a military academy. So it's two sides of the same coin, an element the episode does address, but quickly chicken away from... I'll, I'll talk about it a bit more because uh, the episode does that more than once. But there's a scene where Riley and Ellie are sneaking out into the mall, and Riley admits that she's been recruited as a firefly. She does the typical spiel of talking about liberating the quarantine zone, fighting against Fedra, and Ellie points out that all they've done is make Fedra crack down harder since they bombed a supply depot, which hurts everybody in the zone. Ah, so Fedra's not entirely bad. <laughs> Fascistic bags, starving their own population. Uh, fireflies blowing up the storage depot didn't help. It's a great little moment that addresses how messy the fireflies really are, and that they don't even really know why they're doing what they're doing. They're rebelling because they're angry, but there isn't really a plan beyond that. Hell, the game makes it even more blatant, but I'm saving that for now. Because really, the episode is more about the tragedy of Ellie losing her friend since the two spend time together in the abandoned shopping mall, turning the power back on and having fun in the ruins of old civilization, playing video games, checking out the stores, even riding the carousel. As it turns out, this was all to give Ellie one last good night before Riley leaves Boston for good, as the Fireflies ordered her to ship out. This was all done so she could say goodbye to her friend, and unfortunately, during their hijinks, they wake up a pack of infected. The two are bitten and decide to turn together, but as we know, Ellie ends up being immune, and is captured by the Fireflies. I really do think this episode is the one where the show finally starts hitting a good stride. It just picked the worst place to do it in, since so many people resented it for getting in the way of the main story. Because yes, this ends up just being a backstory dump, but at the very least I'll put it above episode 3, because the backstory actually factors into a character who is alive and is motivated to do things. You see how Ellie lost someone herself and wants to make sure Joel survives. Even if it's pointless in regards to moving the plot forward, at least it gives more context to Ellie in a good way. Now if you hated Left Behind from the get-go, that's not changing. Even I think it's just sort of filler to explain a part of Ellie that didn't really matter, which is how she got bit, but fuck it, you know? Some people really like it as a tragic coming-of-age story, and I can't begrudge them that. It's just a matter of personal preference. Now after this is flat out my favorite episode of the whole show. The only one I will say completely nails the tone of what Last of Us is supposed to be. It knows what the game is, and it doesn't make any fucking dumbass change that made me tear my hair out. That is the episode covering the cannibal camp. For those that don't remember or did not play Last of Us, after Joel gets injured, Ellie has to find a way to keep him alive, hunting for food and scrambling to find medicine up in the mountains of Colorado also trying to keep him warm because it's frigid winter. Unbeknownst to her, they're actually being hunted by the gang they ran into at the university, who want revenge for Joel killing so many of their guys, outright viewing him as a crazy man in the mountains. So the leader, David, and his guys find Ellie during one of their hunting parties, tricking her into running back to where she hid Joel and kidnapping her. 
The show follows basically the exact same structure with a few caveats. That being, they actually show more scenes of the camp's perspective, much like how they did with Kansas. The difference being, I think this is a far more refined version of that same idea. Specifically because the figure leading the camp, David, is a much better written character, and his actor is a million times better. You see? Everything happens for a reason. He's a former teacher turned preacher who essentially treats his camp like a congregation, but they never go so far as making them outright a religious cult or anything like that. Instead, it's simply that the camp latched onto religion as a way of holding on to hope after the apocalypse. David himself is self-aware that they look weird to outsiders, and is even willing to poke fun at himself. Is this some weird cult thing? Uh, well you sorta of kinda of got me there, I am a preacher. And his actor, Scott Shepard, does a great job of keeping the character grounded. It would have been so easy to go full psycho villain like Kathleen, especially since he has way more opportunities to do it, being a religious leader of a camp full of cannibals, who has another element I'm not bringing up just yet, but you really do see how he worked to keep the guy feeling human. David truly doesn't view himself as the bad guy. He's simply doing what he needs to do to keep his people fed and comfortable. Even when he has to do something like smack a little girl in the face, you understand why he did it, because he wants to keep the situation under control and can't afford for his people to fly off the handle and do something stupid. In a setting like The Last of Us, a little girl asking for revenge for her dad isn't just a kid talking shit. That's a potential spark that can set off a fucking powder keg. So the guy makes it clear that his authority as leader cannot be challenged. There's a lot of nuance to his character and performance that really flesh him out in the right way. Like they establish that only a select few in his camp are aware of how they eat human meat, which paints him in an even worse light, since he's tricked these innocent people into eating human flesh, and he's still thinking himself as the hero, which plays into that point I mentioned with violence and Joel. Ellie actually challenges them on trying to judge Joel, saying that they have no right to be angry about their dead man, since they attacked first, and they've been killing and eating scores of people. Joel was simply defending himself from being attacked. They have just as much of a right to live as the cannibals do. It actually manages to comment on the cycle of revenge in a way that isn't annoying, which is a fucking miracle to say the least. They also take their time going through the events of the game at a good pace. It doesn't speed through the parts that are just recreations of the cutscenes. Instead, they pretty much copy them shot for shot. Also, you get to watch Troy Baker get meat cleavered, which I like a lot. Fuck your NFTs. I could keep going, but you all get the point. Episode 8 to me is the pinnacle episode of The Last of Us. It actually hits the right notes and keeps the spirit of the game completely intact. So this is the one I'll recommend to anybody that wants to check this show out. It's about the only one I will undeniably say is good. Now episode 9, the finale, is similar with only a personal gripe to it. Which makes sense since they were both directed by the same guy, Ali Abasa, who has made some pretty great films. Even if that troll one is fucking weird, just just going blind, you'll see what I mean. It's it's weird. Regardless, the finale handles, well, the final level of the game, when Joel and Ellie make it to Salt Lake City. You get the iconic moments, the giraffe scene and getting captured by the fireflies, though they change it to where that sequence in the subway doesn't happen. They get ambushed and taken instead of dealing with the infected and almost drowning. Which I'm fine with, even if at this point the infected have only really been a factor in like four episodes. One, two, five, and seven. And even then it varied how severe the threat was. Though this also adds a new scene, which is actually of Ellie's mother, who's played by Ashley Johnson. I told you she showed up. Anyway, she's heavily pregnant and in labor and forced to run from an infected chasing after her. She's bitten when she's cornered giving birth and begs Marlene to kill her and take care of Ellie. It's basically trying to explain how Ellie is immune, being birthed by an infected woman, which I guess somehow gives her the antibodies or it affected the fungus. Not gonna lie, it's another one of those scenes where you could take it or leave it. If you want to view it as how Ellie could have possibly developed her immunity, it's kind of dumb since it's a pretty drastic ass pull that explains something nobody cared about the answer to. But it could also just see it as explaining how Marlene knew Ellie and why she cares about her, which it does a far better job at. You also have a monologue from Joel where he explains that he attempted suicide after losing Sarah, but failed. Some people hate this monologue. Same with the conversation he has with Tommy in episode 6, where he almost breaks down begging Tommy to take Ellie to Colorado, as he fears he's getting too old to protect Ellie and doesn't want to lose another daughter. The people who hate the scene view it as Joel essentially being a pussy and breaking down crying, but I don't see it that way at all. Yeah, he's having trouble controlling himself, but I never felt it was out of character or something insultingly bad. In fact, I saw it as Joel trying his best not to break down and keeping himself as the stoic he usually is. 
but now that he's faced with the possibility of her dying, he just can't keep it up anymore. And him admitting his suicide attempt, to me, is Joel finally letting himself be vulnerable with Ellie, something he never did before. So it was a good, you know, symbolic way of showing they have finally reached that level that we've wanted them to. Regardless, you have the reveal that Marlene and the Fireflies intend to kill Ellie to harvest her brain in hopes of experimenting on the fungus, since the strain she's infected with is asymptomatic and essentially has chemicals that trick other infected cordyceps victims that she herself is one of them. It makes normal cordyceps think that she's cordyceps, it's why she's immune. Which doesn't explain why the zombies would be trying to eat her, but you know. Hey guys, one last Saul Goodman appearance here. You might think this explanation makes sense. The fungus is tricked into thinking Ellie is already infected, so it can't affect her. The problem is that Neil's interview where he explains that the infected only attack others for trying to stop the spread of the infection causes a plot hole here, since Ellie is attacked by the infected and even bitten once again come episode two. It's even a dark joke that they draw attention to. And episode five had her trying to outrun a child clicker that specifically targeted her. If the fungus is simply trying to spread, wouldn't she be shielded from the presence of zombies? Like the advanced infected in All of Us Are Dead or I Am A Hero. This is a non-issue if you disregard the interview, but then you have the problem of the infected acting out of character during Tessa's death scene. Long story short, it's a bullshit explanation that tries to add more legitimacy to the idea that Ellie was supposed to die in the hospital. But fuck that noise, the fireflies are still morons. Last cameo for the video, remember that Walter White eats used diapers? Had a bullshit explanation somehow. Of course, Joel is horrified and Marlene fucks him over, having him thrown out of the hospital and told that if he comes back, he will be killed. This causes Joel to realize Marlene is kind of an impolite person, and he calmly goes to discuss the matter with the doctors like gentlemen. Somehow this ends up with everyone in the hospital dead, and Joel manages to rescue Ellie from being experimented on. Along the way, executing Marlene as she fails to convince Joel to let them keep Ellie, telling Ellie that the hospital was attacked by raiders, and that the Fireflies stopped looking for a cure anyway. So just forget this ever happened and don't ask any more questions. After this, they make their way back to Tommy's settlement, and it's all a happy ending. It's false. Now, the sequence is basically the same as in the game, minus a few details. In the game, Joel is led out by a single soldier who he quickly overpowers and tortures into telling him where they took Ellie. In the show, it's multiple soldiers, like two guys. But he uses a staircase to his advantage to turn things around for him. Also, instead of a long shootout where he has to work his way to the surgery room, you have this slow-paced montage of Joel killing his way through the hospital. It's kind of a mixed bag where it feels both not long enough and a little too rushed, since it doesn't really show you much of the brutality of the shootout. In fact, it feels like they wanted to adapt it as a longer scene and they crunched it down to be a montage, since you see stuff like him getting into cover, reloading, picking up different weapons, sneaking up on bad guys. It seems like this was meant to be part of an entire chunk of the episode, because this is actually one of the shorter ones, coming in at around only 43 minutes. There are parts of it I really like, seeing Joel pull out the switchblade and stab a guy to death when he runs out of ammo. That was cool. That was clever. And the way he's able to just skulk to the hospital like a fucking ghost, it really puts into perspective that when Joel is angry, he is death incarnate. I like it. To put it in perspective, the filler episode with Bill is a full 30 minutes longer. It seems like there's multiple minutes worth of episode that just isn't there, and they smush down the action to maybe around a 3 or 4 minute montage. It could have been budget, because once again it really seems like there are budget issues that pop up now and again, but we just don't know. Some people say that's on purpose to push the shootout as a tragedy, but I don't really buy that, because it doesn't do anything that really pushes Joel as being psychotic or evil. Yeah, he executes dudes that are surrendering him, but there's no point where I'm actively like, holy shit, Joel went too far. No, he's simply acting ruthless to a faction that directly fucked him over. I repeat, just because you say we're friends now, stop fighting, doesn't mean he's gonna forget what you did to him. I think it's more likely that they didn't have the money to go as far as they could have. And it is weird, because the budget for each episode ranges from 10 to 15 million each. It's one of the most expensive HBO shows out there. There really shouldn't be moments that make the audience go, did they just not have the money? Hell, the showrunners outright complained that they couldn't do a montage of how the infection affected the world in episode 2 due to a lack of money. There are entire zombie movies with far more complicated sets and sequences with lower budgets than an episode of The Last of Us. There's something really wrong here, because I shouldn't be noticing actors wearing fresh clothes in a setting that's supposed to be inspired by the road, which, by the way, had its own film adaptation that looked substantially better with a budget of only 20 million, and they even went out of their way to avoid using shortcuts like CGI. Now, I think we've finally reached the point that we've all been waiting for. The hospital scene and Marlene. 
was Joel justified? It's been a question raised since the first game came out. It's actually one of the questions that fans love to debate back and forth, because on paper, Joel was the bad guy. He sacrificed the world to save the girl he grew to love as his second daughter. He's a selfish prick to put his own needs above the rest of humanity. Some people say every person that dies after the first game is directly a kill by Joel. But hold on a second, because that's not completely accurate. To get it out of the way, yes, there is perspective bias. We've been following Joel the entire game or show, so we're going to sympathize with him above any other character. The thing is, that's not the only reason Joel isn't the villain here. In the game, there are constant signs the Fireflies aren't being completely honest with their intentions. Hell, the rest of humanity is split on the faction. Some think they're the last hope for civilization, others find them to be idealistic troublemakers that make everything worse. Even Tommy, who was a Firefly and believed in their cause, completely ditches the group when he realizes it's not worth it. Joel outright makes fun of Henry for wanting to meet them. Heard the Fireflies are based in the West somewhere. We're gonna join up with them. Something funny? Oh, it just seems like there's a lot of people putting their stock on the Fireflies these days. Of course, come Last of Us 2, we're led to believe that they were fighting for the greater good and that the cure totally would have worked. It was just Joel dooming humanity for his own gain. But that's Last of Us 2, where Neil got rid of the people that specifically had the job of keeping him from jamming his foot in his mouth. Yeah, Neil Druckmann fucked over Bruce Straley and Amy Henning. Bruce is still pissed off about it to this day, and ever since, Neil has been doing everything he can to rewrite history and make it seem like he was the one man who made The Last of Us. So fuck you. But really, when you dig into the Fireflies in the original game, they were absolutely not the good guys. You see, I listed off Children of Men as a major influence for The Last of Us. Children of Men is the novel written by Phyllis James that was later adapted into the film of the same name by Alfonso Cuaron. The film, by the way, is a fucking masterpiece and I legitimately believe it's one of the greatest films ever made. Please sit down and give it a watch when you can. The story revolves around a dystopian future, 18 years after humanity has stopped being able to reproduce. The youngest person on the planet is in their early 20s, and the world has devolved into anarchy, with entire nations falling apart out of a sense of hopelessness. The protagonist is a man named Theo, a former activist who has given up and gotten a meaningless bureaucracy job after the death of his son during a flu pandemic a year before the mass infertility. His wife actually still leads an activist group, specifically focusing on the refugees trying to escape into England to get away from their collapsed nations. While his wife is still a true believer who seeks out peaceful methods, she's quickly usurped by a militant faction that wants all-out war with the government, resorting to terrorist bombings and assassinations to get what they want. Theo is dragged into the conflict when he discovers that they have the only pregnant woman left on the planet, a young girl named Ki. Theo helps her escape the group, referred to as the Fishes, and they go on a journey to find a group of scientists working on a solution to cure the mass infertility. The story sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? I wasn't kidding when I said this was a major influence on The Last of Us. Even the name of the group in each story is similar. The Fishes, the Fireflies, both symbolic animals that represent hope for the future. The ichthys fish is a common symbol in Christianity, which in Children of Men is used to push the themes of hope and faith in the face of despair. And the fireflies have that famous tagline, when you're lost in the dark, look for the light. They're also both rebellion groups fighting against an oppressive government they see as stomping on human rights and becoming more violent and ruthless as things get desperate. Both groups hold the key to saving mankind and make a deal with the main character to transport them to safety. And said main character is a burned out survivor that lost all hope after losing their child. Both sides fuck over the main character and put the last hope in danger, completely missing the point of what their goal was in the first place. Hell, this exact point is the entire reason the plot of Children of Man kicks off. The fishes want to use Key as a political symbol for leverage, while Theo wants to find her a doctor in case something goes wrong with the pregnancy. Yeah, well, whatever's going on, whatever your political ideas are, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Oh, come on! She needs a doctor. You? The humanitarian group viewed the last hope of mankind as a tool they could exploit. Even at the very end, when they literally drag her into the middle of a war zone, they don't even take the time to check to see if it's a boy or a girl. We need the baby! We need him! It's a girl, Luke. The Fireflies do very similar things, but the game does work to make it more subtle. You gleam it through the consequences to their actions throughout the game. The bombing they perform in Boston is met with gratuitous hitback, with Fedra massacring the Fireflies and pushing them out of the city, to the point even Marlene is wounded and almost killed. One of the collectibles you find throughout the game are dog tags of dead Fireflies, showing that this rebel group burns through soldiers fast. In the University of Colorado, you find out they're experimenting on monkeys with cordyceps and one of the scientists got themselves infected because he was a dumbass that tried letting the subjects out instead of killing them, showing that their idealism blinds them to the reality of what's going on. When you get to Pittsburgh, 
You discover the Rebellion was groomed and backed by the Fireflies, who were quickly executed right alongside Fedra after the people decided they didn't need them anymore, making it clear the group really doesn't have a plan beyond fighting Fedra, that all their talk of bringing back the old ways is bluster, considering the rest of the world doesn't give a shit and won't play along. You're given more than a few hints that the Fireflies have no clue what they're doing and view Ellie as a tool. Hell, the person in the Fireflies that we directly see give a shit about Ellie is Marlene herself. The rest are violent thugs that are just the same as the bandits you've been killing all game. So the idea that it was ambiguous that the Fireflies weren't trustworthy isn't really true. It just wasn't shoved in your face and required a little bit of digging. Because they aren't cartoon characters who spell out that they're mustache-twirlingly evil. They believe they're doing the right thing, it's just that they're stupid. And what do I mean by missing the point? Well, the idea that Ellie represents a cure is the wrong lesson. Because Last of Us addresses that the zombies are slowly whittling away as the main threat. The show especially doubles down on this, outright stating that the infected don't like drifting away from cities. Funny enough, both games ignore this since there's plenty of fights with the infected in rural areas. But the point is, they do the Walking Dead thing of instead focusing on factions of people fighting. And at that point, a cure for cordyceps isn't the solution, because nobody is separated into groups in fear of infection. They're scared of other groups. Ellie represents hope for humanity in that she's willing to trust others and wants them to trust her. She makes a character like Joel, a guy who swore off all human connection and became just another violent criminal, see the good in the world and want to rejoin humanity, with the two of them going to Jackson showing that Joel wants to patch things up with his brother and start a new life. I know the whole man is the real monster is a very tired trope, especially in zombie fiction, but Last of Us is specifically a case where it is the point. Much like in Children of Men, you never find out how Cordyceps mutated. Instead, all you see is how it brings out the true nature in people. Some become absolute psychopaths only out for themselves. Others work to help others and protect human life. What caused the collapse wasn't the fungus turning people into zombies. It was that humanity closed itself off from each other in fear. Now the only chunks of America left are glorified nomadic tribes or brutal city-states. Ellie's supposed to show hope for the future, not because she's immune, but because she's an optimistic kid that can see that life is worth living for, even with all the tragedy and horror that she and Joel experience. So boiling the hospital question down to was Joel evil completely disregards the influences of Last of Us, and a lot of the foreshadowing, subtext, and just outright intentional ambiguity. It also introduces a multitude of plot holes, like the logistical aspect of how a faction on the verge of extinction could mass-produce a vaccine, how the hell could they get multiple doses of a vaccine out of a single subject that they need to kill, or why are they so quick to kill the only hope for humanity without running other tests first? Like, maybe you don't need to remove the whole brain? You can just scrape off some of the fungal samples and study those without killing Ellie, or take her blood, which a note in the game confirms does grow fungal colonies when exposed to the open air. There's a million other ways they could have done this, and it only works this way in the game when you factor in that the Fireflies in the story are stupid and crazy. Also the fact they never even ask Ellie her opinion on the matter. Oh sure, Last of Us 2 has Ellie be completely down for dying in the hospital, but that's a retcon because in the first game she has no idea what the plan was. She even talks with Joel about places she wants to go after leaving Utah. It was done to defuse the point that it's fucked up Marlene rushes to kill Ellie to get her cure, viewing her friend's child as a disposable tool with mild self-flagellation to make herself feel better over the guilt. I hope this makes the fuck Joel crowd take a step back and realize that yeah, the dude really isn't anywhere near as evil as Nydog would have you believe because despite the insistence on the matter, which fans of the show are going to be intimately aware of come Season 2, the actual original game doesn't do that. In fact, it kind of goes to show who was paying attention to the details versus who was just watching cutscenes on YouTube, because some of this shit really wasn't subtle. They literally turn an entire city into a raider army. They release fungus-infected monkeys out into the wild. The fireflies are fucking dumb. Anyway, this is all I gotta say about The Last of Us show. It is easily one of the most mixed bags I have ever seen in recent memory. You can put your hand in and get $100, or you're pulling out a pissed off snapping turtle. And some of the flaws in the show were bafflingly stupid, to the point it directly hurt other episodes. I really can't blame anyone that swears the whole thing off and goes, fuck this shit, Last of Us ended at the first game. Because in all honesty, it's the best mindset to have. The first game is more refined, the visual design is more memorable, and it remains the best possible version of the story. I consider Last of Us the show to be that thing journalists point to when their parents make fun of them for playing video games. It's a product of insecurity, to be accepted as a real piece of art, instead of just holding a middle finger up. I probably won't check out Season 2. First season was more than enough personally, 
and the few genuinely great episodes aren't enough to motivate me to stay loyal. Hell, I can only wholeheartedly recommend two entire episodes, and the rest have serious problems that flat out annoyed me or made me angry. The last two episodes are the best of the show, with episode two being a third best, dumbass ending aside, and the left behind one not much further down. It just suffered from being a filler episode placed at the worst possible time, about a subject that already divides fans of the game as it is. I can definitely say that if you've never played the game, this show is a great Walking Dead alternative. The problem is... that. It has everything Walking Dead has, from cool moments to outright so bad it's good moments. Hell, I've heard this show referred to as just another zombie thing more than once by people in real life, which makes me think back to the sheer sting that must have for Naughty Dog, but it's time to call it. This video ended up being a tad bigger than expected, but I had fun diving into this rabbit hole. To the credit of the show, it gave us something to talk about, for better or for worse. Still, I'm tired. Until next time, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. See you guys. Ah, fuck you! Hey, loser. Do you want a shirt? Do you want a t-shirt? I have shirts now. Look in, look in the description for a link to a t-shirt you can buy. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll kill your family. If you don't buy the t-shirt, I'll poison your dog. If you don't buy the t-shirt, you're gonna be the only person in town that does not have a t-shirt. Everyone's gonna look at you funny. There's gonna be social consequences to not having one of these t-shirts. I'm now making express threats of violence against you if you do not buy my t-shirt. I will call the police, tell them how they're not, you know, you're not buying my shirt. They're gonna plant crack in your house, and they're gonna arrest you and then beat you up in a jail cell. Buy my shirt.